Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, my pleasure today to introduce uh, Professor Jean-Jacques uh, Greffet from the from Paris, from the Institute of Optic. He is uh, specialized in optics and has uh, contributed a lot in that field, and in particular in plasmonics. And uh, today he is going to talk about uh, the field of optics, uh, but this time oriented ver thermal emission. So the talk is entitled Tailoring Thermal Emissions with Metasurfaces. Mm -hmm. Professor Greffe, it's your turn. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we're here now. Okay, good. Um, so, and I don't see the slides. Good. I think we're ready now. So thanks a lot for this invitation. I'm very grateful for, for that. Uh, I will be discussing metasurfaces today uh, with... Uh, introduction of some additional content about uh, heat transfer and thermal emission. So it will be a mixture of metasurfaces, coherent optics, um, statistical physics, temperature will be involved here, and also heat transfer. So next slide, please. Uh, we will be discussing uh, uh, the application of thermal emission to infrared sources. Uh, infrared sources are necessary for gas detection, for infrared spectroscopy, and also for communications. Uh, they are certainly not mainstream tool for communications, but there are a number of niche applications for infrared on short distance communications. Now, if you want to uh, fulfill these applications, you need sources and detectors, of course. And uh, as far as sources are concerned, uh, the choice is uh, typically OPO, which are beautiful but bulky and quite expensive sources, very powerful and coherent sources. There are quantum cascade lasers that have been developed 20 years ago and are now commercially available. The, 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 again, it's, um, they could can be powerful, they, they are coherent. They are certainly not cheap. Um, so if you want cheap uh, back to Edison's days, it's incandescent sources. So this is a typical global that is, is used in uh, all uh, fully transformed infrared spectrometers. And those are hot membranes that uh, you can buy. Now, if you want to hit that, uh, there is this black body law that tells you that the spectrum depends on temperature. So here I'm reminding you that at 300, can, can you see my mouse I'm, I'm showing? No. Ah, okay. So there, there must be an option for a pointer somewhere. Can you guide me? Um, just a second. No, okay, maybe it's because you are sharing your screen, of course. Uh, I'm stupid. Yeah, uh, I don't think it's possible. So, um, um, okay, so on the lower uh, right part of the panel, you see the black body function spectrum. So in red, you see the curve in red is 300 Kelvin. So it, it has a peak at 10 micron, meaning that you and me, we are emitting infrared emission at 10 micron with a peak wavelength at 10 micron. Uh, if we increase to 1000 Kelvin, which is typically what temperatures for most practical incandescent sources in the infrared, uh, you see that you move to the mid infrared, three, K, three microns. And the sun, of course, it's at 6000 Kelvin, and then it emits light. This is the yellow line. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is what thermal radiation is about. Uh, this is uh, typical picture of what you can see in, in a steel factory. Uh, and, and this has a number of features that I'm, I'm declining in the next slide. Uh, so next slide, please. 
uh, the, this typical light emitted by incandescent sources has a, a number of features which are not necessarily attractive. One of them is low brightness. So let me explain what I mean by brightness. It's uh, how much power we have in a given beam. When I'm saying beam, I mean a given solid angle and a given cross section, a given area. So brightness is power per area and per solid angle. A laser can have huge brightness. The brightness of um, thermal sources is limited by the number of photons that you can put in a mode, and this is given by Bose-Einstein statistics, which depends on temperature. So this is definitely limited by uh, fundamental physics. Another uh, property, that's, which is typical of incandescent sources, is a broad spectrum, the, the black body spectrum I just showed. Uh, usually they are quasi-isotropic, uh, so no directivity with uh, incandescent sources. And uh, the efficiency, of course, is very low. Uh, you know that uh, many, many types of incandescent sources are banned from the market in, in Europe uh, because of low efficiency. And uh, you cannot use incandescent sources if you want to use them for uh, uh, communications applications, which is, of course, one of the main applications of optical sources uh, because you cannot modulate them at high rates. Now, the question is, why do we have all these properties? Are they fundamental? It, 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 those properties, they are taken for granted. Uh, so the question is, is this really fundamental or is this only related to some lack of engineering tools? So next slide, please. So I'm showing in red what we can engineer and I'm showing in black which we cannot engineer. So low brightness, as I told you, this is due to Bose-Einstein. So there is no way you can cheat with Bose-Einstein statistic. Of course, you can make a laser, but it's no longer, you don't have a temperature defined anymore, and it's no longer an equilibrium source. So in as much as you can define a temperature of a body, uh, the brightness is, is a given, and it's limited by Bose-Einstein, and it's not very large, as I said. All the rest is a matter of engineering. So by using metasurfaces, I'm going to show that we can have um, good temporal coherence, so a narrow spectrum. We can engineer directional sources, meaning that they can have large spatial coherence. We can engineer sources with a very good efficiency. There is nothing fundamental in the low efficiency of commercially available uh, incandescent sources. And we can modulate at very large uh, frequencies. So I'm going to review what has been done over the last 20 years regarding all these properties and how we can design metasurfaces to engineer these properties. I try to give you some hints on the, on the physical insight on how it works and why it's possible. Uh, and then at the end of the, the talk, I will focus on recent results on very fast modulation, showing that we can, uh, we've been able to modulate beyond 20 megahertz on incandescent source. So next slide, please. Okay, so that, that, that's the outline. First part, tailoring infrared radiation, this overview, and then we'll focus on fast modulation. Let's, next slide. So, first of all, a key concept to try to understand uh, how we can uh, use metasurfaces to tailor uh, infrared emission is Kirchhoff law. Now, Kirchhoff law tells us that, so first of all, the specific intensity, I of lambda, which is uh, this brightness, power per solid angle and per unit area, this is proportional to emissivity and uh, black body intensity. So emissivity epsilon lambda of theta uh, was introduced. It's a concept that has been introduced by Kirchhoff in 1860. So let me remind you that the Maxwell's equations were published in 1878, 18 years after that. So this is well before the very concept of Henle reflection coefficient and fields and so on were introduced. 
So Kirchhoff was able to show that the emissivity is equal to the absorptivity. So absorptivity is just a fraction of incident power, which is absorbed by a body. If we assume that the body is opaque, then what is absorbed is what is not reflected. So one minus R. Now, the key point is that uh, emission uh, depends on temperature. So that belongs to statistical physics or thermodynamics. And uh, reflectivity and absorptivity belongs to coherent optics. And we can engineer those things due playing all the tricks we play with metasurfaces. So since the emiss emitted power is the product of emissivity, which is nothing but absorptivity and the black body function, you see that we, we can engineer uh, emission. Now the question is, well, that was derived by arguments in the framework of geometrical optics. That's the only thing that was available uh, to Kirchhoff. So it's not obvious that this is still true. So next slide, please. Um, so one of the things we could think of doing is to take a silicon carbide grating. Uh, silicon carbide was chosen because it can support surface waves, which are similar to surface plasma. In this particular case, the resonance is in the infrared, and this is surface for non-polaritons. Uh, and uh, by ruling a, a grating properly designed, you can end up with total absorption. And uh, I'm showing the reflectivity of grating. So, so this is an atomic force microscope. On the left, you see an AFM image of a grating. On the right, you see the measured and uh, theoretically predicted reflectivity of that grating. And you see that there is total absorption at 11 microns. So question is, what happens if you hit that surface? Uh, do you see a peak? at that particular frequency and for that particular angle. We know that this is a, a resonant feature that happens for a well-defined angle. So uh, next slide. So here I'm addressing the question of whether this Kirchhoff argument might still be valid, yes or not, uh, if we go beyond geometrical optics. So if we try to think in terms of wave optics. And uh, what I would like to do here is to give you a hint of, so the answer is yes, Kirchhoff law is valid. And the answer that what I would like to do here is to give you a hint of why it is. Um, so on, uh, I'm considering a medium here in, in orange, yellow, in which is say metal, uh, above medium one is vacuum. And let's consider emission. So emission is, is schematically shown as a red arrow. And uh, this light emitted, if we try to think in terms of electrodynamics, what's that? Um, we, we have in the medium, we have electrons, we have uh, phonons, we have uh, excitations, uh, you name it. Uh, which are in equilibrium, because we assume that we can define a temperature T inside the medium. So we have a local thermodynamic equilibrium in the medium. And all these matter excitations must be in equilibrium with uh, electromagnetic field in the medium. Even though the medium is opaque, that simply means that there is some skin depth, that the electromagnetic fields don't will propagate uh, very far. Uh, however, there are electromagnetic fields. And they are in equilibrium, so they are given by black body, the, the, the black body uh, intensity. So now what is a emitted field? It's just uh, photons which are inside the medium, which go propagate towards the interface. They are transmitted at the interface. Once they are transmitted by the interface, you call them emitted. So you see that there is a one-to-one -one connection between this emissivity and the transmission factor from two to one. Now, what would be absorption? So we look on the right part of the panel. We have an incident plane wave coming to the surface. Fraction, part of it is transmitted at the interface. So the, the photons which are transmitted penetrate in an absorbing medium. If we assume that the medium is opaque, thick enough, uh, they will be absorbed at the end of the day. So you see here that the transmission from one to two, from earth to metal, is equal to absorptivity. So what I'm saying here is that 
Kirchhoff law is nothing but the equality between the transmission from one to two and two to one, and that's a, a direct consequence of the reciprocity. It's a property of friend and reflection factor. Experimental results, uh, and you see that indeed uh, on the lower right panel, you see the measurement uh, in red and the calculation in green. And, and you see that indeed uh, we can observe a directional emission, which is a proof of the special coherence of the emission. And with the argument I just developed, we can understand that in a very simple way. It's nothing but a filtering of the black body. Black body is isotropic. And the interface that has been engineered taking advantage of the existence of surface waves with the grading. And by properly engineering the interplay between the grading and the surface wave, we managed to have a transmission factor, which is essentially zero. You, well, it's below 10%, as you can see, everywhere except in one particular angle. So that's how we uh, tailor the directivity of the source. So it's nothing but a, a, a resonant transmission factor. Next slide. Um, we can try to give some physical insight on where the special coherence is coming from. So special coherence means that uh, if we look at the field at two different points, they are specially correlated. So uh, electromagnetic field, uh, as I said, is due to uh, emission by uh, billions of electrons in, in a metal. So this is a fundamentally statistical random stochastic prop process. Uh, so we define, uh, we can define the correlation function over space or over time. So here I'm interested in special coherence, which is defining the, the special coherence at two different points. And the question is, therefore, uh, can we compare the field at two different points on the surface? And these little red arrows are here to illustrate what would happen for um, one source that would be on the left. It would excite a plasmon, and the plasmon propagate over long distances, uh, typically 100 microns. And uh, as it propagates, it's scattered by the different uh, periods of the grating. And uh, the, these fields, which are all due to the same plasmon, so initially the phase is totally random because the source is totally random. But once you launch a plasmon, its phase is well defined, and therefore all these uh, all, all, all the in all, all the field scatter at different points along the propagation of the plasma can interfere. So, so that's what's producing the the coherence. Next slide. Okay, so we can uh, do more advanced design and end up with uh, extremely narrow uh, beams. So this is a two-dimensional SIC. On the lower left panel, you see that it's uh, a K representation and you see that we have an, uh, an angular beam of the width which is typically one degree. Uh, next slide. Um, okay, so this is just to uh, make a, a direct calculation of the so-called cross spectral density. So this is the correlation function of the fields at two different points. And if you look at the inset on the upper panel at a given z close to the surface, we're looking at the correlation functions as a function of x, two different points separated by x. And we, we plot this, and the, you see that the correlation shown in the lower panel for silicon carbide uh, at two different frequencies. One is a frequency where there are surface waves, and the other frequency, 9 microns, is without. It, there are no surface waves at that particular frequency because the material doesn't have an ep negative epsilon. And, and you see that uh, this is a clear indication of what is responsible for this very long range coherence or correlation. Uh, so here with that, we clearly see that the coherence is due to the surface waves, not to the grating. The grating is here only to reveal that coherence and to um, make sure that the energy can leak uh, they, because of the grating, the surface plasma become leaky surface plasma, and that's why we do get radiation at the end of the day. 
Next slide. Okay, so this is just a, um, a slide intended to explain uh, how we do compute. So I, I gave a very physical and hand wavy argument. I want to be slightly more um, rigorous here and more quantitative. So to describe this uh, light emission process. So the basic idea is to say that the currents are due to fluctuations, thermodynamic fluctuations of the charges. On average, the currents are zero. Uh, of course, maximum sequations are linear here. So the electric field is connected to the current density through a green tensor. It's the most general linear relation in between both. Uh, because on average the current is zero, on average the field is zero, but this is not what uh, we are detecting when detecting energy. We need a quadratic quantity. Next slide. So if we look at the correlation function, then we see that what is needed is the correlation function of the currents. And this is given by the fluctuation dissipation theorem, which was derived in 1948 by Kalin and Welton. And uh, that tells us that the, the fluctuations of the currents, which are definitely the source of the emitted power, is proportional to the imaginary part of the permittivity, so the term that describes absorption. And here we recover the Planck's function with h bar. So this is where the quantum part came into the game. So this is the framework that has been used. Uh, so you see that at the end of the day, the only thing you need to do is to compute Green's functions for the relevant geometry and uh, for simple structures like interfaces. This is uh, fully analytical. Next slide. So, so far I've answered the question how we can make directional forces. Now I would like to address the question of how can we shape the spectrum, the emission spectrum. And here I'm showing two papers by uh, the group of uh, Shai Sheish and uh, Padilla. Uh, so here the idea is to start with essentially a mirror. So a mirror reflects everything, does not absorb, so does not emit, according to Kirchhoff law. So basically the, the two samples that you can see here are made of mirror, it's aluminum mirror on the left, it's a gold mirror on the right. Then there is a layer of silica on the left and alumina on the right. And then we have patches, which the, the size of the patches is on the other of uh, the wavelength or slightly less. Aluminum patches on the left and gold crosses on the right. So that forms metal insulator metals resonators. Uh, you have modes, surface plasmonic, surface plasmon guided uh, modes in the in the gap, and by tailoring the the lateral size and the thickness of the gap, uh, you can tailor the resonance frequency. These resonators absorb, and uh, you can uh, optimize this absorption in order to have a metasurface which has a, a resonant absorption at a given frequency. Then by heating those surfaces, uh, because absorption is equal to emission, we can achieve uh, selective frequency cell selective emitting surfaces. Um, next slide, please. So on the left, we there is a different strategy. Uh, so this is a, a paper by the group of Shanwei Fan. Uh, you see a stack of different layers red. And what is uh, totally on the left is the hot part. This is um, an emitter. And uh, the idea is to essentially have a, a Bragg mirror on top of it. And you define this Bragg mirror such that it has, a, it's actually a filter. You define it in such a way that there is a transmission factor, which is one for a given frequency. It's just a multi-layer filter. And the idea is to have this multi-layer right on top of the emitter. So of course, you could say, well, you take any black body, and then you take a filter, and there you go. You have filtered, and then you have monochromatic light. 
there is a tremendous difference uh, between the two cases, whether the filter is deposited right on top of the surface or whether it's just uh, uh, added on, on the light path. Um, the difference is that when you built in the filter on the surface, then no photon is emitted except the useful photons. If you just take a black body source and then you filter, then you emit uh, about several orders of magnitude more power than needed, and um, most of it is lost. So, so you have um, an, you increase the efficiency by several orders of magnitude by designing your your source in such a way. Okay, uh, let me move on. Next slide. So this is a, an example of a metasurface where we wanted to combine both directivity and spectrum for a practical application, which is um, CO2 detection. So we want to detect a gas. So you use a detector and you want to measure the absorption. If there is some gas in, in the room, then you, you get the signal in the transmission, which low is, is reduced. Uh, typical applications, will uh, you will have such a detector in your home. It's operated with a battery and you don't want to change the battery every six months. So it has to, to have a very low conception such that uh, you can, the battery will work for 10 years. It was a real challenge. It's a real application. Uh, so here we need to combine, you need to, if you want to save energy, uh, you want to emit light only in the forward direction such that it goes towards the detector only at the right frequency you want to be uh, molecularly molecular selective and uh, uh, to do that we we again we we use this um, array of patches uh, if you look on the left part of the panel you see that there is a mirror of gold then a layer of silicon nitride and then a patch of golds and the red color indicates where the field is large. So, so here you have a clear uh, indication of this uh, cavity resonance of the field in the gap. How do we control? So that's how you, you control the, the frequency, of course, by changing the length uh, of the, the, the square of the patch. You essentially you modify the fabric perron uh, resonance. So this is how you, you can choose this resonance at the right uh, frequency, 4.26 microns for CO2. Uh, how can we design the directivity here? See, we actually find a, a solution by brute force looking at optimization, and we only understood later how it works. So you see on the right panel, uh, the dispersion relation, it's actually a map of emissivity as a function of angle and frequency. So angle, the, the K wave vector is, is 2 pi over lambda times sine theta, where theta is the angle, angular emission. Uh, you see that there is a, a, a large uh, emiss emissivity and therefore a large absorptivity until you cross the and until you, you leave the Brillouin zone. So, so at the relay condition, uh, you, you, the emission, the emissivity decreases. So to explain what's happening, we, we have in the center of the, of the slide, you see what's happening. There is a single mode uh, on the left part at the center of the Brillouin zone. There is a, a single reflection mode your grating has no orders. As you crossed the folded boundary of the Brillouin zone, then all of a sudden you have two radiation modes. So there is one additional order. So you have the zero order, which is always there, and then you have the minus one order. That means that if you have optimized the absorptivity of each patch, when you have a single relative loss channel, then you are in critical coupling. And as soon as you open a new relative decay channel, then you are, you are no longer in critical coupling and therefore your absorption decays. So this is a general uh, mechanism, a rule to control the angular 
behavior of the metasets. Okay, next slide. Uh, next question is, how can we design efficient incandescent sources? So here I want to make a disclaimer. I do not know how to make incandescent light bulbs because incandescent light bulbs need to operate at 3000 3, Kelvin. And when you operate at 3000 Kelvin tungsten wire, then uh, you start vaporizing uh, the metal and uh, therefore you cannot work in vacuum. Now, if you want to make an infrared source, you only heat up to 1000, 1200 kelvins. In that case, there is no problem of reducing the, the mass, the metal mass of your emitter. So you can work in vacuum and by doing that, you totally suppress uh, convection losses. So our goal is to have, we, we hit this emitter using Joule effect. So we have this bulk metal, which receives energy. And the goal is to convert everything into radiation. So the problem is avoid heat losses. So the key uh, mechanism is first to get rid of convection losses. That's by far the leading mechanism. The next loss mechanism is conduction. So what we did here was to use a membrane. If you use a membrane, then you don't have substrate. So you totally remove losses through the substrate and you only get conduction losses through the sides of your membranes. So now the idea is just hit the center of the disc and uh, in such a way that the uh, heat will, will, that goes through conduction to the edges of the membrane, this heat is first radiated before reaching the actual substrate. And by doing that, you can get rid of uh, conduction losses. So if you remove conduction and convective losses, you only get radiation, and that's exactly what you want. Now, if you want radiation at a particular wavelength, you make your uh, membrane selective. And uh, in, if you can do that, and this is a, an, an engineering problem, you can, in principle, achieve a very high efficiency. So the point I want to make here is that physics doesn't tell you that efficiency has to be low. Okay, it's, uh, uh, it's a matter of engineering. So there is a lot of room for improvement in terms of efficiencies. Next slide. Uh, so, so this is how the efficient, the, the thermal relative efficiency increases as a function of the, the reuse of the membrane. Uh, next slide. Okay, so now I'm uh, starting the, the second part of the talk. I want to move into the discussion of uh, how we can uh, modulate. So, so far I've been discussing um, what, how we can use metasurfaces to have directional sources, to have monochromatic sources, how we can make efficient sources. And now I move to, uh, is it possible to modulate the amplitude very fast? So to do that, uh, you have a choice. The emitted uh, intensity is given by the product of emissivity and black body radiation. So you can either modulate emissivity or modulate the temperature. Uh, so next slide. Uh, this is an example of modulation of emissivity. So this is a work in the group of Professor Noda in Kyoto. Uh, it's a system which consists of uh, a, a large number of quantum wells, 63. Uh, the reason is that each quantum well has a typical absorption on the order of a few percent. So if you want to have a, a good absorption, you need a lot of them. And by applying a voltage to the system, you can deplete the quantum wells and therefore suppress or, uh, uh, their absorption. So it, this, in this way, you can modulate the absorption and therefore the emissivity. So the device is at high temperature, so you don't change the temperature, it's always hot. 
Uh, however, essentially what you do is that you, by applying a voltage, you make it oscillate between a black paint state and a mirror state. That, that's the concept. And uh, the way you can do that, how fast you can do that in principle is how fast you can remove electrons from quantum waves. So this is uh, essentially limited by an RC uh, constant time at the end of the day. And uh, with this, they demonstrated 600 kilohertz modulation. Uh, the drawback is that this is gallium arsenide, so there are limits in uh, the temperature you can use. You cannot heat very much, and, and of course, this is a limit to how much power you can emit. Next slide. Um, so this is a, a different concept. Here we are not modulating the emissivity. Here the devices are emit light by modulation of temperature. This is graphene. And when I apply the voltage to graphene, you, you can transfer the energy to the electrons and uh, the heat capacity of the electrons is so small, then you can uh, easily reach several thousands of kelvins. Um, and I'm not saying that the lattice of the graphene is at high temperature, only, only the electrons are at high temperature. So uh, that doesn't require that much energy because it's, um, the, uh, again, the heat capacity of the electrons is very small. The problem is that um, these graphene devices are at most 100 microns, um, patches of 100 microns size typically, and the absorptivity is 2% in the visible. So this is quite low. So these devices can be modulated extremely fast because the only limit to how fast you can modulate is the electron phonon coupling. So the, the time it takes for the electron to cool down is the time required by the electron to transfer the energy to the phonons. And this is typically picoseconds. So, so this is a potentially ultra fast source. Uh, it's only a visible sources. Uh, and uh, again, the, the power emitted is extremely low. So those are not definitely not good uh, sources for um, infrared, mid-infrared uh, emission, but they, in, in terms of um, modulation, it, it's those are incandescent sources definitely, and, and uh, with, with constant times which are absolutely amazing. Uh, next slide. Okay, so the idea here is to 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 take advantage of the fact that if you design tiny objects and you make them hot, what limits you in this here is not the electron phonon time, but it's the diffusion time. So here uh, we just assume that everything is isothermal. If we, in, if we consider a hot part of material with typical thickness A, the time it takes for cooling down diffusion is, as always for diffusion, the length square divided by the diffusivity hole. So here it's thermal diffusivity. So orders of magnitude are as, as follow. A thermal diffusivity is typically 10 minus 6. Uh, if you consider a micrometer, 10 minus 6, you see that your typical decay time is microsecond, 10 minus 6 again. So microseconds, 1 megahertz, if you make it 100 nanometers, you can go up to 100 megahertz, okay? So that's the idea. If you have some material which is hot with a thickness of 100 nanometers on top of a substrate, uh, then you can potentially reach 100 megahertz. So the issue is that if you have 100 nanometer thickness, it's not much to absorb. So we need to play tricks of nanophotonics. Next slide. Okay, if you use metals, um, the, uh, a, thin, a thin plane, a thin sheet of metal will, uh, can absorb. If you, there is an impedance matching condition, which is the product of conductivity by thickness. If you make this equal to epsilon naught C, then you can absorb 25 to 50%. Next slide. If you deposit that on top of a mirror at a distance of quarter of wavelength, then you can have 100% absorption. This is a 
This concept was first introduced to absorb radar, radar waves during the First and Second World War. Uh, next slide. So uh, that's the basic idea. Uh, if we have a thin metallic sample, we can have large absorption. Um, typical thicknesses for having this type of absorptions are on the nanometer scale, so, so that's good. Uh, that means that we can go well beyond 10 megahertz. So what are the requirements? We, we want a large emissivity, so that should be possible using these concepts. Cooling time, if the thickness is on the order of tens or fifth, yeah, tens of nanometers, it will be much faster than, than megahertz. We need to be able to heat these uh, systems at high temperatures above uh, 600 Celsius, typically around 1000 Kelvin. Uh, so that uh, introduces a lot of constraints on the material that you can use and uh, on, on, the, on the pair of materials. So for a, me a very good metal is plati platinum, a very good uh, transparent spacer. There are not many trans transparent uh, spacers in the infrared. That, that's a very serious issue. You want to choose one that uh, can sustain high temperatures. So silicon nitride is one of the few materials that you, you can use. Uh, it will be transparent uh, in the 3-5 micrometers range where the atmosphere is transparent. And you can deposit that on a mirror. Here it's gold, it could be uh, molybdenum. Um, in the infrared, most metals are very good mirrors, so this is not a big issue. Another issue is uh, that uh, you need to use, uh, uh, you need to transfer uh, the uh, efficiently the electrical power from your source to your device so you need to make an electrical impedance matching so so this grid this meter material has to be both electrically at 50 hertz and optically at five microns three microns uh, match uh, with the environment so this is possible. Uh, so we design and optimize this uh, set of uh, platinum wires. Next slide. And um, well, after a long uh, fabrication procedure development and so on, you end up with a device which has a size of 100 microns by 100 microns. And uh, the first step to, to see that it can uh, emit very short light pulses is to send uh, a pulse of current of 10 microseconds. It's a Gaussian pulse, electrical pulse of current that goes through the system. And I, I'm showing the signal here. So you see that it's pretty narrow. The simulated signal, which is indicated with the dots, this is due to, the, the, this is um, the result of a measurement of the temperature. Since it's platinum, you can measure the resistance, electrical resistance of the device. And because platinum has a resistivity that depends linearly on temperature, you can use the device itself as its own thermometer. And by plugging this measured increased temperature in Planck slope, you see that we are able to perfectly reproduce the dynamics of the emitted signal. Uh, next slide. So the test of how is this device able to sustain high modulation? So, so here we're showing the emitted signal as a function of uh, frequency. So we're modulating uh, with a harmonic with a sinusoidal system. Where you see two curves, one is 4T, the other one 4TM. You've seen that it's a grid, so this is the typical polarization system. So as you expect, the system is emitting and absorbing at TE polarization and much less in TM. Um, and uh, we see uh, uh, different regimes in frequencies, and this uh, frequency regime is a direct reproduction of the temperature behavior of the system and uh, the temperature behavior of the system depends so the on, on a high frequency here in the middle in the rose pink uh, area you you have a one over square root of omega decay and that's the typical decay for a one dimensional system so when you modulate the surface of 
when you have a one dimensional system, the, the amplitude decays as one over square root of omega. That, that's what we see. So this is a kind of slow decays for high frequencies. And you see that we have a, a large signal beyond 10 megahertz. Uh, we were limited by our detector with a cutoff frequency of 13 megahertz. Next slide. And now I want to discuss the emitted spectrum by this system. So you can expect uh, some spectral resonance due to the fact that we have this interferential enhancement of the absorption uh, due to this Salisbury screen with a spacing which is a quarter of wavelength. Uh, however, I want to draw your attention to the fact that we the spectrum, of course, it's a black body spectrum. And the black body spectrum depends on temperature. This is what I showed in the second slide. And here we're changing the temperature by more than 100 degrees, uh, 10 million times per second. So that means that the spectrum of emitted light is changing 10 million times per second, continuously. So what does it mean? What is the emission spectrum for that source? Usually we have stationary sources. Uh, we tend to think to take for granted that we have a stationary source. This is not a stationary source. The spectrum is changing all the time. Uh, however, there is a regime where it's still possible to define a spectrum. And this is when you can make a first order expansion of the temperature increase. So if this delta T can be expanded, and uh, more precisely, if the second and third order uh, do not contribute significantly to the emitted power, so if this, then you see that the spectrum is given not by the black body function, Planck's law, but by its temperature derivative. So this is indeed uh, the regime where we are operating. When delta T, this regime of delta is valid for delta T up to 150 degrees Celsius, which is the typical regime where we have been operating. And then uh, we can uh, recover from the emitted signal the emissivity by normalizing by the non uh, derivative of the Planck's function. Next slide, please. Okay, by doing that, we are able to recover, to measure the emissivity. So here, uh, uh, I'm showing on the left the uh, theoretical emissivity, which is nothing but the theoretical absorption. And you see that the sample had been designed to have an emissivity peak at 5 micron, again, because this is a transparency region of the atmosphere. On the right panel, you, you observed uh, again, the absorptivity, which is theoretical. With diamonds, the measured absorptivity, so this is one minus a reflection measurement that um, we hit the, the sample to make sure because, of course, the refractive index may change. So, so we did the, the absorptivity measurement by measuring the reflectivity in the same conditions, so under heating. And the measured emissivity from the emission data. And you see that there is a very good agreement. The discrepancy in the region 8, 9 microns is partly due to the fact that in the model, in the calculations, uh, we do not account. So this is for a pure silicon nitride. The silicon nitride that we use as deposited does contain um, hydrogen, and, and this includes, um, this is responsible for some absorption lines that uh, are not included in the, in the data, in the tabulated data. So, 10 minus 6, which is not very good, but it's similar to what you get for LEDs, commercially available LEDs, in this regime. So this is very surprising to hear that LEDs may have such a world plug efficiency. Uh, keep in mind that uh, uh, when you move from visible to infrared, so here, this is 5 micron, 
So if you move from 0.5 to 5, uh, it's one order of magnitude. The spontaneous emission rate goes like omega cube. So you reduce the spontaneous emission rate by three orders of magnitude. And that's why uh, the efficiency of uh, LEDs in infrared uh, goes down uh, dramatically as compared to what they are in, in the visible, of course. Okay, with that, uh, I'm coming to the end. And so those are the couch, all the co-authors in, in, in bold, all the former members and current members of the group. And uh, my conclusion slides is a short summary. Uh, I've been showing how metasurfaces allow to design quasi-monochromatic sources, directional sources, um, polarized sources, uh, and then I discuss how we can modulate this very fast. So taking advantage of thermal properties of metasurfaces. And I also discuss how we can uh, design efficient uh, sources for infrared uh, emission. Thank you very much for your attention. I apologize for uh, this connection issues and not having uh, a pointer and I I'm, I'm, would be happy to answer your questions if there are any. Thank you.